Broadcasting from beautiful downtown Tallahassee, it's Nantan Lupin at the drive-in. Today's film is The Birdman of Alcatraz, 1962. This is a wonderful, inspiring story based on a true story that makes you say, thank God that guy is locked up. This movie was directed by John Frankenheimer and based on a book by Thomas E. Geddes. Of course, The Birdman was brought to life by arguably one of America's greatest actors, Burt Lancaster. Even the name sounds macho. Lancaster played the role of Robert Stroud, a prison lifer in a couple of different prisons. Lancaster was born in Manhattan. All four of his grandparents were immigrants from Northern Ireland. Lancaster grew up on the streets and was a tough character. He became interested in gymnastics and was a high school athlete. Following his mother's death, he dropped out of college and later joined the circus at age 19, where he could use his considerable physical skills. He met his lifelong friend, Nick Cravat, during the circus period. In 1939, a hand injury forced Lancaster to quit his beloved circus. For a time, he worked at a department store and as a singing waiter. When World War II broke out, he joined the Army and ended up in the USO, entertaining troops. He served in the Italian Theater of Operation. Following the war, he was not excited to become an actor, but he tried out for a stage role and landed the part. With his intense blue eyes, athletic physique, and devilish smile, it is not hard to see how he got the role. Although the play ended rather quickly, he received his first movie role in The Killers 1946 based on his performance. After one movie, he was a star, and he kept after it. For a time, he played tough guys, but he also took roles where he could show off his acrobatic talent, such as The Crimson Pirate 1952. Before long, Lancaster started his own production company and was successful at that as well. In 1953, Lancaster had one of his greatest and most well-known roles, First Sergeant Warden in From Here to Eternity, 1953. The love scene with Lancaster and Deborah Carr kissing as the wave crashed over them has been parodied and copied endlessly. He should have received an Oscar for this role, but he had to wait until Elmer Gantry, 1960. He didn't slow down a bit, starring in The Young Savages, 1961, as ADA Hank Bell. Judgment at Nuremberg, 1961, as Nazi Dr. Ernst Janning with Spencer Tracy and many others, and of course, The Birdman of Alcatraz, 1962, as Robert Stroud. He continued to make movies through his life and slowly drifted from the action hero to deeper parts, political roles, or comedies. In 1964, Lancaster was cast in a fairly low-budget, anti-Nazi movie with Paul Schofield. He showed his acting and acrobatic talent in this movie as a member of the resistance and a railroad yard manager. If I did not already say that From Here to Eternity 1953 was his greatest role, I would say this is. Maybe he had more than one. He turned in another stellar performance in Seven Days in May 1964. Lancaster took the role in a comedy, The Hallelujah Trail 1965 followed by a Western hired gunman in The Professionals, 1966. Then he jumped into the disaster flicks with Airport, 1970. This was followed by a string of first-rate military films, including Twilight's Last Gleaming, 1977, Go Tell the Spartans, 1978, and Zulu Dawn, 1979. Of course, he threw in a horror film with The Island of Dr. Moreau, 1977, and one of my personal favorites, Local Hero, 1983, where he played eccentric Felix Happer. He took a role in an over-the-hill buddy film, Tough Guys, 1986, and his last film, which is one of his greatest, Field of Dreams, 1989, as Dr. Archibald Moonlight Graham. Lancaster was politically liberal and worked with and for many good causes, including the March on Washington in 1963, fighting McCarthyism, and fighting for AIDS research. He died in 1994 from coronary problems at the age of 80. Carl Malden was cast as Harvey Shoemaker, a warden and prison bureau official. I spoke about him in episode 26, Time Limit, 1957, if you want to hear more. Thelma Ritter was cast as the Birdman's mother, Elizabeth McCartney Stroud. Ritter was trained in high school and attended the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. However, her career did not really take off. In the 40s, she worked in radio. A brief uncredited part in Miracle on 34th Street, 1947, changed her life. She received lots of movie work for the next 12 years. She was a major actor, and just a few of her films are All About Eve, 1950, 
Rear Window, 1954. Daddy Long Legs, 1955. The Proud and the Profane, 1956. Pillow Talk, 1959. Second Time Around, 1961. Birdman of Alcatraz, 1962. And How the West Was Won, 1962. However, I will single out one other movie, The Misfits, 1961. Ritter holds her own as Isabella Steers cast alongside Clark Gable, Marilyn Monroe, Montgomery Cliff, and Eli Wallach. Sadly, Ritter died after a heart attack at the age of 66. Neville Brand played prison guard Bull Ransom. Of course, Bull is what the cons call a guard, so I don't know if he had a real first name in the movie. Neville Brand joined the Army in 1939 with plans to be a lifer. He served in World War II in Europe, where he was wounded and also received the Silver Star. For a time, it was believed that he was the fourth most decorated soldier of World War II. However, when they put him in a training film, he saw a new path forward. He left the Army and used his GI Bill to study acting. After training, he worked on stage until he got a big break and was cast in DOA 1950. With his gravelly voice and unprepossessing face, he was bound to play the heavy. One of his quotes is, With this kisser, I knew early in the game I wasn't going to make the world forget Clark Gable. Unquote. He was cast as a nemesis of William Holden in Stalock 17, 1953, and was fantastic. He may be best known for playing the dim-witted Texas Ranger, Reese Bennett, in TV's Laredo from 1965 to 67. With 137 acting credits, Brand died at the age of 71. Betty Field was cast as Stella Johnson, the love interest slash business partner of the Birdman. I covered her in episode 5 of Mice and Men 1939, but I gave her pretty short shrift, so I will try to do a little better here. Betty Field was born in Boston in 1913. By 1932, she was enrolled in the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. She spent the 30s working on stage until she got her film break in What a Life, 1939. This was followed the same year with her bid in the previously mentioned of Mice and Men. She jumped between the stage and film, but never found the film that would make her a star. In 1949, she was cast as Daisy Buchanan in The Great Gatsby, but she was not well received, so back to the theater. Field returned to the movies in the 50s, a threadbare, hardened character in such films as Picnic 1959, starring Kim Novak, Bus Stop 1956 with Marilyn Monroe, and Peyton Place 1957 featuring Lana Turner. One of the roles she is most remembered for is an older floozy in Coogan's Bluff 1968 with Clint Eastwood. Sadly, she died at the age of 60, never being noted for the talent she really was. Telly Savalas was prisoner Fedo Gomez. Savalas was a child of Greek immigrants. He served in the military during World War II. He was good at playing characters that were a little off, like Maggot in The Dirty Dozen, 1967, or like Sergeant Guffey in The Battle of the Bulge, 1965. With 127 acting credits, he is best known as the ball-headed, lollipop-sucking detective Theo Kojak, or the Players Club commercials he starred in afterwards. Who loves you, baby? Edmund O'Brien played Tom E. Gaddis, the author of the book about Stroud and the narrator for the film. O'Brien was born in the Bronx in 1915. It has been reported that he learned magic tricks from his neighbor, Harry Houdini. He was in the school theater and majored in drama at Columbia. He started on Broadway with his debut at the age of 21. He was brought to Hollywood, and he was uncredited in his first film, Prison Break, 1938. The next year, he was in a supporting role as Gringorio in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, 1939, with Charles Lawton. He joined the Army Air Force during World War II and returned to a solid career as a supporting actor. By 1950, he was given the lead role in DOA. In 1954, he won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for his role in The Barefoot Contessa. He was nominated for another for his role as the drunken senator in Seven Days in May, 1964. O'Brien also appeared in the Sam Peckinpah classic The Wild Bunch, 1969. Through the 60s and 70s, O'Brien worked on television. He died in 1985 and is buried in California. Hugh Marlowe was cast as Leavenworth Warden Albert Comstock. I gave the rundown on Marlowe in episode 28, World Without End, 1956. Story. This movie begins with a group of convicts being transported by train. One of the prisoners, Robert Stroud, played by Burt Lancaster, used his hat to break open a window to let in fresh air. One more. 
move right in, I'll take you off at the neck. This got him in trouble with the guard, Bull Ransom, Neville Brand, but Stroud was defiant. Let me give you the backstory up to this point in the movie. Stroud ran away from home and an abusive father at the age of 13. By the time he was 18, he was in Alaska, pimping for 36-year-old Kitty O'Brien. In 1909, an acquaintance of theirs, bartender Charles Van Diemer, didn't pay Kitty and beat her when she complained. Stroud tracked down Von Diemer, fought with him, knocked him unconscious, and shot him on the ground. Somehow, with the help of a lawyer his mother hired, he was only convicted of manslaughter, while the police reports seemed to indicate first-degree murder. At the time, Alaska was not a state, so it was under federal jurisdiction. He was sentenced to 12 years in the federal penitentiary on Puget Sound's McNeil Island. While at McNeil Island, he stabbed at least two prisoners and a hospital orderly. He was in conflict with staff as well as his fellow inmates. For all these crimes, he was given six more months and was ordered transferred to Leavenworth Prison in Kansas. This is the point where he was on the train. So back to the movie. When the rebellious Stroud arrives at the prison, he immediately comes into conflict with Warden Harvey Shoemaker, Carl Malden. Stroud is in the chow hall when a guard writes him up for some infraction. He asks the guard to not write him up so he will be able to visit his mother. In real life, it was his brother that he had not seen in eight years. So in real life and in the movie, Stroud stabs a guard in the heart, killing him. I tell you, I got to see him. And I told you to get back to your seat. You ain't a man, Kramer. You're a dog puke. They don't show the trial, and most of this movie is shot in cells and exercise yards, often with only the bird man in the scene. Outside of Stroud's window, they are building a gallows where he can be hung. Stroud's mother, Thelma Ritter, conducts a publicity campaign and even makes it to the President of the United States. Eight days before he is to be hanged, his sentence is commuted to life. His original sentence was that he should be held in solitary until executed, and being upset that he was spared, the prison system arranged that he would carry out his life sentence in solitary confinement. Consider this. You will not be permitted to associate with the other prisoners, not even to exercise with them. You'll eat all your meals alone for the rest of your life. Visiting and corresponding privileges will be limited to your immediate family. And there'll be no work. Nothing to do but count the hours and the days and the years. At this point, the only thing that Stroud cares about is contact with his mother. He spends time in his cell with Bull Ransom sitting outside on an apple crate. In the movie, he is taking his exercise walk alone and finds a baby sparrow. In real life, it was three babies in a nest. Stroud does the bug smashing that has been seen in every prison movie where one of the cons has a bird. Reference Shawshank Redemption. Warden Shoemaker leaves to reform the prison bureau, and Stroud gets a new warden to allow pets after the train sparrow puts on a little act. For some reason, in real life, prisoners could keep pets at the time, so Stroud began acquiring canaries. The other prisoners quickly followed suit, and Stroud takes in more birds as other inmates tire of them. There's a nice scene where the prisoner in the next cell, Fedo Gomez, Telly Savalas, thinks his bird is sick, so he gives it to Stroud for a year to heal it. It turns out that the bird is pregnant, and Stroud's bird count goes up. He eventually releases the sparrow to the wild. In the movie, Stroud slowly makes peace with Bull and gets his apple crate so he can build a bird cage. Will you get this, bucko? I may be just a uniform to you, but you've got no patent on feelings. I'm a man the same as you, and I want to be treated like one. So from here on out, you'd better come up with a few manners with me. Or don't even expect the time of day from yours truly. In real life, up to 300 birds were flying wildly in Stroud's cell. It must have smelled like bird hell. In the movie, the sparrow returns to prison just before all of the birds start getting sick with hemorrhagic septemia, a full-body blood disease. Stroud begins testing compounds using the scientific method to isolate a cure. Oddly, one of the most heart-wrenching parts of this movie is when the sparrow dies of the disease. Slowly and at great cost, Stroud finds a cure and begins writing articles in bird journals. He also begins selling his cures through the mail. This is a great burden to the prison that must screen all incoming and outgoing mail. One day, Stroud gets a visit from bird fancier Stella Johnson, Betty Field. My curiosity really got the best of me. So I, I just had to find out who Box 7, Leavenworth, Kansas was. So I... 
I wrote to the uh, postmaster at Leavenworth and asked him. He told me it was the federal penitentiary. And they immediately go into business together selling bird remedies. Her real name was Della Mae Jones. The authorities tried to limit his birds. The first one states that no pets of any kind will be allowed in federal penitentiaries. The second directive forbids any inmate to engage in any kind of commercial enterprise. But Stella helped him run a campaign with the bird lovers and he ends up getting another cell and scientific equipment. This starts a rift between Stroud and his mother. In the movie, Stroud marries Stella in a common law ceremony as part of a loophole from the Louisiana Purchase Treaty. In real life, he did it because Kansas law prevented the transfer of prisoners married in Kansas. At this point in real life and in the movie, Stroud's mother broke with him and began publicly stating that her son should remain in prison. My son is where he belongs. I shall do nothing to obtain his release from the penitentiary. With everything going fine in the prison, they come in and tell Stroud that he is being transferred to Alcatraz and he has 10 minutes to get ready. Bull Ransom gets teary at the thought of his long-term charge leaving. Stroud has to leave all of his birds and equipment behind. In real life, he was caught making booze with his equipment, and the prison used it as an excuse to get rid of a real pain in the ass. Stroud is shipped to Alcatraz, where he cannot have pets. That's right, he was the Birdman of Leavenworth, not the Birdman of Alcatraz. Alcatraz, or the Rock as it is known, was a maximum security prison built for the worst of the worst. When Stroud arrived, the prison warden was Shoemaker. While on the rock, Stroud wrote a history of the U.S. penal system, but the warden would not allow it to be published. In the movie, they show Stroud as ending a prison riot in 1946, and Shoemaker saying he can trust the man because he never lied to him. There are no, there are no, no more, more guns, guns in d -block. How do I know there are no more guns up there? Because I give you my word. Sir, are you going to take the word of one convict? That one convict's been a thorn in my side for 35 years. But I'll give him one thing. He's never lied to me. Nothing like this ever happened. During the real riot, the guards threw grenades down into the cell block, killing the rioters. If you take the tour at the National Park Service unit, you can still see the chunks blown out of the cement floor. The movie ends with the aged Stroud being transferred off the rock after 17 years. At the dock, he meets Thomas E. Gaddis, Edmund O'Brien, the author of the book about him. Post-movie Stroud was transferred to the Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in Springfield, Missouri, where he died at the age of 73. Burt Lancaster made this essentially psychopathic killer seem sympathetic. Those who knew him said he was a real mean guy, and worse than that, a trouble-causing jerk. The movie ends with some facts about how long Stroud was in solitary. World-famous short summary? Solitary confinement makes a prisoner go to the birds. Hey, thanks for listening. You can find my show on iTunes by searching for Nan Tan Lupan or Classic Movie Reviews. Just look for The Wolf when you get there. There are links to all other medias like Facebook, Twitter, Stitcher at snarkymoviereviews.com. You can really help the podcast by subscribing and leaving iTunes reviews. Cheers!